Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, it's been roughly three weeks since we reviewed the Core i9-9900K, and in that time, basically no one's been able to buy it, and locally here in Australia, it doesn't look like we'll be getting any more stock for at least another week, and how much more we'll be getting uh, in a week is anyone's guess, but I'm guessing it will be bugger all. Anyway, despite the fact that you can't really buy a Core i9-9900K, we're seriously considering re-reviewing it, uh, because we think it's probably worth doing, and we'll discuss why in this video, and then I'll actually turn it over to you guys to vote on what you think the best course of action is. Today's video has been sponsored by ASRock and the new Phantom Gaming range of Z390 motherboards. The Z390 Phantom Gaming 6 and 9 include a blazing fast 2.5 gigabits per second network interface, offering gamers and content creators two and a half times the bandwidth compared to standard gigabit ethernet. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Now, since the 9900K reviews first went live, uh, we saw a few strange anomalies, uh, mostly relating to power and thermal performance. Uh, the results did stir up quite a bit of chatter regarding whether or not the 9900K in its stock trim uh, really ran at over 80 degrees with a high-end cooler, or is it more like 60 to 65 degrees? To better answer that, I guess you have to first define what stock actually means for the 9900K. Officially, Intel specifies that the Core i9 9900K has a TDP rating of 95 watts. They state an all-core base frequency of at least 3.6 gigahertz, and this is what the TDP is measured from. However, they also state that if just a single core is active, it will operate at up to 5 gigahertz. So the two frequencies officially given are a 3.6 gigahertz base and a maximum boost of 5 gigahertz. This means there's a 1.4 gigahertz disparity between the base and turbo boost frequencies. Now it's important to note that prior to the release of the eighth gen core series, Intel did actually specify the all core turbo frequency. For example, they made it quite clear that the Core i7 7700K would target and operate at 4.4 gigahertz when all four cores were under heavy load. However, with the release of the 8th gen series, which brought about the first mainstream 6-core processor from Intel, uh, they made the decision to no longer disclose the all-core turbo frequency. Of course, a predefined maximum all-core frequency still did exist, and for the 8700K it was 4.3 GHz. Intel was just no longer specifying this frequency and therefore uh, no longer had to guarantee that it would be achieved by all hardware configurations, for example, low-end motherboards. The 8700K was right on the edge of the 95 watt TDP, and depending on the motherboard quality, this figure could be exceeded. Under optimal conditions with optimized voltages, the 8700K pushes package TDP to roughly 95 watts at the 4.3 GHz all core frequency, opposed to the 75 watts the 7700K maxes out with its 4.4 GHz all core frequency. So, whereas the 7th gen core series part came in well under the 95 watt TDP rating, the 8700K was right on the edge, and again, we saw on lower quality boards that pumped more voltage into the CPU in an effort to maintain stability, that the TDP was often pushed well over the 95 watt rating. Now, for the new Core i9 9900K, the official default clock multiplier table states that with all eight cores active, it will operate at 4.7 gigahertz and achieves the same frequency with seven and six cores active. Then with five and four cores active, it will go up to 4.8 gigahertz, 4.9 gigahertz with three cores, and as I said earlier, five gigahertz with one and two cores active. However, as I noted earlier, Intel only states an all core base frequency of 3.6 gigahertz and a single core maximum turbo boost frequency of five gigahertz. So whatever happens between those variables depends on the workload and crucially, how long the workload runs for. For this, Intel specifies a time duration for certain power limits, commonly referred to as PL1 and PL2. Now, we've covered this on the channel before, but in short, PL2 is our boost consumption. It defines how much power the CPU can use in bursts, and for the 9900K, uh, the limit is 119 watts. Intel says that the PL2 state could be sustained for up to 100 seconds, but in reality with a 9900K, uh, we've seen that it's just shy of 30 seconds in a typical workload, a core workload, uh, at least with the Z390 motherboards that we've used with the 95 watt TDP enforced. At which point the power limit kicks in and that limits the frequency down to whatever fits within that 95 watt envelope. Uh, we've typically seen during stuff like our Blender workloads that all eight cores will clock down to 4.3 gigahertz, 
rather than the maximum 4.7 gigahertz that can be achieved without any power limits in place. So the problem we have here is that motherboard manufacturers for the most part aren't abiding by either of these power limits. Instead, they're just targeting the clock multiplier table as they would have done with the seventh, sixth, and so on uh, generations of core processors. Now you could say that the motherboard manufacturers are cheating, but we don't think that's it. We still feel it's Intel who are cheating their own spec. There's just simply no way the board manufacturers did this on their own. And it'd be a mighty big coincidence that they all decided to break the spec in the same way. And surely ASUS, MSI, ASRock, and Gigabyte have all worked alongside Intel engineers to create their Z390 motherboards. Anyway, let's not get into that just yet. For now, let's look at how badly the TDP rating is getting abused for sustained periods. Here I've tested the 9900K in our Blender work lab without any TDP limitations in place using a number of core count configurations. Leaving hyperthreading enabled, I've tested the 9900K in its stock trim with all eight cores enabled, and then seven more times with a specified number of cores enabled at the BIOS level. I've also set the frequency to meet that of Intel's multiplier table. With just a single core enabled, the 9900K targets 5 GHz, and here we see a package TDP of just 35 watts, well under the 95 watt rating. Now please note all this testing was done with the voltage held at a steady 1.188 volts. Moving on, with two cores enabled, the 9900K targets 5 GHz, and here the package TDP is raised to 49 watts. 49 watts with just two cores enabled. With three cores, the frequency drops to 4.9 GHz, and this resulted in a package TDP of 66 watts. Four cores targets 4.8 GHz, and here we're hitting 83 watts and already, with just half the cores enabled, we're not that far off exceeding the specified TDP rating. Interestingly, whereas the Core i7 7700K maxed out at just 75 watts, the 9900K with the same amount of cores and threads enabled hits 83 watts. That's an 11% TDP increase, though we also do have a 9% increase in clock speed. And the rest of that margin uh, can likely be attributed to any changes in voltage along with a much larger L3 cache of the 9900K. Of course, we're not stopping here. The 9900K is a runaway train at this point as we're hitting a package TDP of 96 watts with five cores enabled at 4.8 gigahertz. Then with six cores, we drop down to 4.7 gigahertz and here the TDP hits 114 watts. Then 130 watts with seven cores, and technically this shouldn't be possible with Intel's PL2 spec as the limit here is 119 watts. And then finally 153 watts with eight cores enabled. And at this point we've exceeded the base TDP rating by a little over 60% and the PL2 short burst spec by almost 30%. So what happens to the clock speeds on a long run test if we enforce the 95 watt TDP? As expected, the single and dual core configuration still hit five gigahertz because as we saw previously, this sees the 9900K come in under the 95 watt rating. Then with three cores active, we still hit the targeted frequency as this only saw a package TDP of 66 watts. However, with four cores active, we see a 50 megahertz reduction in frequency with the 95 watt limit in place. This is then extended to 250 megahertz with five cores active, 350 megahertz with six cores, 500 megahertz with seven cores, and then finally 700 megahertz with all eight cores active. This means we're seeing up to a 15% decrease in clock speed for our Blender workload. And for less optimally configured motherboards running more voltage, this margin will likely increase. I should also note that I'm not using the integrated GPU for any of this testing. Now, since first reviewing the Core i9-9900K, I've tested over a dozen, well over a dozen Z390 motherboards, uh, ranging from the cheapest $120 to $150 US models, right up to the much more expensive flagship versions. Out of the box, all boards from MSI, Gigabyte, and ASRock run without a TDP limit in place, uh, even with the default BIOS configuration. However, this isn't the case for any of the ASUS boards that I've used. The default out of the box uh, cleared BIOS configuration employs a 95 watt TDP limit. To remove it without having to dig into the power settings and do so manually, you'll have to load an extreme memory profile and then agree to use in the ASUS optimized settings rather than Intel settings. Basically ASUS optimized means ignoring the TDP limit and running at the default clock multipliers like boards from MSI, Gigabyte, and ASRock do. Essentially then, Intel has two separate specifications for their high-end CPUs. 
a TDP limited specification that they loosely define, or a clock multiplier table specification. And enabling one means it's impossible to achieve the other. The TDP limit means you won't reach the intended all-core clock speed, while the clock multiplier table spec means you're running well above the TDP. This seems to have caused a divide between our viewers on how we should test Intel processors. Uh, should we make them abide by the specified TDP rating, uh, just as AMD processors do, or should we test them running at the maximum allowed clock multipliers, as they seem to do out of the box on pretty much all motherboards? Uh, right now we're hearing a lot of back and forth between, well I suppose AMD fans, AMD loyalists, and then Intel fans. Intel, those extremely loyal to Intel for whatever reason. It's not really good to be in either of those camps, but we seem to have a lot of people that are. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is that opinions differ obviously between these two, but we've also seen over the last year that there's even the people in each group seem to be unable to agree on how we should be testing these processes. So, for example, with the uh, eighth gen release, AMD's Pitchfork crew were shrieking at the top of their lungs how we should test with a 95 watt TDP in place, the 95 watt limit. While the, well, let's call them the Blue Man Group members, they strongly disagreed with that. They wanted to see the Intel processors pretty much tested how they, well, how they perform out of the box on the motherboards that we were testing with, which I suppose is fair enough, even though it was technically out of spec, depending on how you define the spec. Anyway, now with the ninth gen series, it's a bit all over the place. Some AMD extremists want us to actually test with the TDP removed now. I guess they want to see the 1900K burn. But then on the other side, we have some Intel extremists that now say motherboard manufacturers uh, aren't abiding by the Intel spec and are accusing them of making the 1900K uh, run much hotter than it should. And well, that's partly true, I suppose, but I'm, again, not convinced that motherboard manufacturers are really the ones at fault here. Testing with the 95 watt TD spec also introduces a few testing issues for reviewers. You can no longer just show a single or even worse, the best Cinebench R15 run with an Intel CPU. The same goes for benchmarks such as V-Ray or really any short rendering test like Cinebench or V-Ray or really any short test that uses all eight cores. So ideally you'll need to show short and long run results for all applications as performance could vary by as much as 20%. Anyway, to try and avoid hearing from the most passionate brand loyal fans, we've created a poll and we want to know what you think. Is showing 95 watt limited results misleading, uh, even if it is included alongside unlimited testing? Personally, Tim and myself think the best course of action is probably to revisit the 1900K review with both unlimited and 95 watt limited results with both short and long run testing. But as I said, we're really keen to see what you think and what you believe is the most appropriate way to handle this sort of thing in the future. And basically whatever you guys come up with in this poll will really influence how we test Intel CPUs moving forward. I guess that's kind of useful as well since Intel themselves don't seem to be able to create a, a concrete, concise specification for their own CPUs. And even if they could, it appears they're powerless to enforce it. And I'm sure that's the case. So please click the link below. It'll be at the top of the video description. That'll head you over to a public post on our Patreon page where you can vote for your preferred option. And yeah, I'm very interested to see where we end up on this one. Anyway, that is gonna do it for this one. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.